Niklas at us and everyone. So, thank you. So, welcome everyone to this talk, which is called uh, Rust-based Runtime for the Internet of Things. Uh, I'm Niklas, I'm from the rainy city in Sweden, as you heard of. And uh, I currently work as an embedded software engineer at a consulting company in Sweden named Cybercom, where we primarily focus on connecting the society. And in my daily job, I mainly write C, but on my free time, I write Rust, of course. And I've been writing uh, Rust for a year now. Uh, and recently, I also graduated from Chalmers University with a master's degree in computer science. And some of the things I will talk to you about today has been part of me and my thesis partner, Fredrik Nilsson's work. Along with that, I, I'm interested in software security in general. I enjoy embedded system, programming languages. And when I don't write code, I usually try to lift some weights in the gym as well. Uh, and what is this talk about? This talk is about my experience using Rust to build uh, Bluetooth Low Energy Firmware. And we have used a new IoT operating system named TOC, which is written in Rust, actually. And we have ported two development kits for IoT prototyping named NRF51DK and NRF52DK. And we have implemented a couple of drivers, uh, including Bluetooth Low, low Energy. And uh, I will focus on NRF51DK in this talk because I will show you some benchmarks on it that we have performed. Uh, further along, I, don't, I, don't, I will not explain what Rust is and how it achieves speed, safety, and concurrency and that stuff because I assume you are already familiar with that. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them after this talk. And if you run out of time, come and see me. I'll be happy to talk to you. Uh, but what is really Internet of Things? Well, it's uh, traditional physical systems that are now getting connected, such as cars, light bulbs, refrigerators, smart fitness bracelets, and so on. But, but what really characterizes these IoT devices? Uh, in general, these are low-end devices that, uh, that are based on microcontrollers, for a reason of low power and low cost. Uh, and, but some of you may not be familiar what really a microcontroller is. It's an entire computer integrated on a single chip, which typically has one, one core CPU with tens of megahertz, tens of kilobytes of RAM, hundreds of kilobytes of flash, uh, but, but lack uh, memory, a memory management unit, which means that they don't have any notion of virtual address space. And also, these are getting equipped with ra radio ships integrated, uh, such as this board here. And a commonly used protocol for this is Bluetooth Low Energy. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, Bluetooth, classic Bluetooth. But you can think about Bluetooth Low Energy as, uh, as uh, Bluetooth Classic's little brother, which focus on low-end devices and low-power applications. For example, an IoT device running, running on a battery can run for months using Bluetooth Low Energy. And it supports a range less than 100 meters. I will show you an example later, so maybe we can try if you can reach it at the back. Um, but Bluetooth Low Energy has two types of packets. It has advertisement packets, which are essentially uh, broadcasting. Uh, for example, this can be used for a, for a device to advertise. I'm device X and you can connect to me and I provide these services. Or other, it can also be used for uh, arbitrary broadcasting such as advertising GPS coordinates or, or something like that. Uh, and uh, these are uh, sent on three dedicated channels uh, periodically. And then we have something called data packets. And uh, data packets are uh, packets which support a bigger payload and are used in, in connections. But I will not talk any more about this because we have not focused on it. I just want you to see the stack to follow along with this talk. But uh, let's continue about the IoT characteristics. And uh, because these devices are located in areas with limited physical access or no physical access at all. 
reliability is more uh, important than in general purpose computers because we cannot rely on humans to recover from failures. And also these are uh, integrated in safety critical systems and these can endanger human life essentially. Uh, also these collect and store a lot of our uh, private, private data about, uh, sus about our daily lives and so on, which means that security and privacy is also important. But, as I said, these are uh, very resource-constrained devices, which uh, limits the number of suitable programming languages. Uh, and they re typically require a low runtime overhead with fine-grained memory control and deterministic behavior. And for those reasons, C and C++ are more or less exclusive in this domain. Uh, but as you are probably familiar with, C and C++ are memory unsafe languages where memory corruption is a problem with buffer overruns and dangling pointers and so on. And also these uh, IoT applications uh, become more and more complex because they need to run several tasks at the same time. They need to provide complex drivers as an IP stack or something like that. And for those reasons, in general, a uh, special purpose operating system is used. In general, these operating systems trade off memory and power efficiency over safety features. And that means that these operating systems don't provide any memory isolation. But what does that mean? Well, it means that there are essentially no, no separation between applications and the kernel. And, and that means that the entire computing base needs to be trusted. So let's consider this. If we have a faulty application with a buffer overflow, for example, what will happen? Will this seg fault, for example? No, it's much worse than a seg fault. It's actually undefined behavior because we have no notion of virtual address space. And this can, for example, write over the kernel and crash the entire thing. And yes, it's not surprised that IoT is insecure. Uh, during this summer, uh, uh, security researchers found a buffer overflow vulnerability in an open source library. We'd made hundreds, millions of devices vulnerable. Uh, but what can we do about this? Well, we can use a new safe programming language, such as Rust or Rust. Uh, and Rust, actually, the benefits of having memory safety prevents these memory corruption attacks completely. Along with fine-grained memory control and low runtime overhead makes uh, Rust an ideal candidate to implement IoT applications in. And and Rust can actually reduce the number of reliable, un vulnerable IoT devices. This sounds great, right? Why don't we write an IoT operating system in Rust? Well, it turns out that somebody has already done this, which leads us into TOC. TOC is a new secure IoT operating system, which actually provides memory isolation. I will uh, come back to that in, uh, in the next slide, how. Uh, but it focuses on reliability and uh, safety. Security, sorry. Uh, it's, it's part of a research project where they rethink the entire IoT domain from the ground up. And TOC actually support, at the moment, TOC supports ARM Cortex M microcontrollers, which you can see here to the right. Oh, and this is one of them. Uh, let's continue and uh, talk about the architecture of TOC because I think it's very interesting. As I said, it provides actually memory isolation, and uh, it talk actually use a process-based abstraction where they have something called user space processes that are, uh, are restricted and executed outside the kernel with uh, restricted privileges. And for example, uh, it, a process only has uh, access to its own heap stack in data segment. And it uses this by uh, using a new memory feature in ARM Cortex-M microcontrollers, which is called an MPU, a memory protection unit. You can view it as a very lightweight uh, MMU, but with no virtual address space. And uh, moving on to the kernel itself, it's kind of a microkernel, but not really, because it has uh, 
two, two components. First of all, they have the, the core kernel, which has a hardware abstraction layer, scheduler, and so on. And then TOC actually has something called capsules. And capsules are essentially device drivers, but because TOC uh, targets very tiny computers, this cannot be executed as uh, separate user space processes. And instead, they are uh, integrated in kernel, but uh, relies on the type system in Rust, uh, which makes it very unlikely that they will fail. Uh, along with that, the kernel itself is statically allocated for uh, safety reasons, but that's all I want to say about TOC, uh, which, uh, moves, which moves us to what we have done. We have used this microcontroller. I will not touch this because it did, didn't work that well before, um, which is a NRF51. It's an ARM Cortex-M0 microcontroller, which has a CPU of 60 megahertz, RAM of 32 kilobytes, flash 256 kilobytes, comes with a radio integrated on the, on the ship in the red rectangle, actually, that is NRF51. Um, and the, process, the microcontroller itself supports some other peripherals, such as AES, true random generator, temperature sensor, and similar. But uh, what have we really done? Uh, to, to illustrate this, this blue, this blue box is actually the NRF51 microcontroller where we have implemented uh, some device drivers, four actually, uh, which is a temperature sensor, AES encryption, true random generator, and Bluetooth low energy driver over the radio. And uh, to create a good example for you to understand what this really is, uh, we created a, a De demonstration app that combines all these drivers. So we construct a Bluetooth low energy advertisement packet and use TOC OS as a device name. And then we encrypt uh, the, the, the measured temperature and the generated random numbers. And let's see if we can get this to work. So this is actually a very ugly Android app that we have created for this purpose. So we have this board here, it's supposed to advertise. Yes, it does. So for example, first of all, in the top here, we have the TOC, TOC OS, which is the advertisement name. This is uh, not encrypted. And then we have the encrypted payload uh, down here, down here. And, uh, and the app actually has the hard-coded encryption key that can uh, decrypt these things. And that's what I wanted to show you. Moving on to, to the general architecture of, uh, of the things that we have implemented, uh, of the Bluetooth low energy device driver, it looks something like this. And it, the blue boxes illustrates uh, user space stuff. And uh, I don't want to scare you, but this is written in C at the moment because um, this has something to do with that TOC uses uh, position-independent code. In theory, any language uh, is supported, but there is some problem with global variables at the moment. So therefore, we have implemented this in C at the moment. But this is, this is, uh, this is really not that complicated, and most of the complexity is actually in the kernel at the moment. But we have a Bluetooth low energy library to, for example, to, to send advertisement, to configure different data, configure the radio to send on a given advertisement interval, and so on. And also, we can use it to do passive scanning. But we don't support uh, connections and uh, complicated security modes uh, at the moment. But let's move on and talk about what we have done in the kernel. And uh, we have something called a BLE capsule, which is essentially the logic of the entire uh, Bluetooth low energy device driver. Uh, it, it keeps track to put the processor to sleep between advertisements and uh, also include a BLE Bluetooth low energy state machine uh, and, and similar things. It's written in 
approximately 400 lines of Rust code, and uh, I cannot show you all the code, of course, but uh, I can o only show you one, one snippet that we have that for configuring data in the in a advertisement packet. And uh, as you can see, we have to use an iterator and do use nested uh, closures to do this because we are uh, iterating through raw bytes here, which is uh, very which is very dangerous. But in Rust, we can use the type system to benefit of this, and this is actually very bug bug prone in C. And moving on, uh, we have something called a hardware module or a BLE radio. This is where we do close to the metal things that we interact directly with, with the hardware. So for example, if you want to turn on the radio, we have to write to some memory mapped I.O. and we write some bits there and voila, the radio is on. And this is uh, implemented in around 450 lines of Rust code at the moment. And uh, it looks something like this. This is very simplified, of course, but we have a, a pointer to, to a, a struct which contains the memory map of this uh, radio uh, registers. And then we can turn on the radio, for example, uh, here. If we, here we dereference the pointer, and then we write, write some bits here. Here we reset the radio and turn it on. Uh, but that's all I want to uh, give you about the actual implementation today. And, but we also wanted to evaluate these device drivers. And we did some comparisons with, uh, with the sta current state-of-the-art IoT operating systems. We elected this based on the, that they are open source. They provide uh, drivers for our board. And they also are open source. And we did, uh, we did actually measure the power on, on the board. Uh, we did this by advertising during 10 seconds, and we configured each uh, operating system in the, in the same way, which was that we used uh, advertisement interval of 150 milliseconds. We used transmitting power of 0 dBm, and we used a payload size of 22 bytes. And for each operating system, we have uh, three bars. The red bar illustrates the total power consumption during, during this period. The blue bar illustrates uh, the power consumption when the radio is on, and the green bar illustrates the power consumption when the, the radio is turned off. And, and this has nothing to do whether they are written in C or Rust, I believe, because these are more or less how good these operating systems are to turn off power-hungry peripherals, such as UART and so on, when they are uh, sleeping. But this sounds great, right? But uh, how has the journey really been? Well, I would say this. Fail, pick yourself up, and fail again, because this has been a very tough journey and a lot of uh, sweat and tears. Uh, first of all, learning an I IoT operating system with limited documentation is, is really hard. For example, how do the system calls work? How do we pass a buffer to the kernel? How do we iterate over uh, raw bytes in the kernel? You saw an example of that earlier, uh, which, which was kind of hard for, for us to understand. And, but uh, Talk has a nice community with an IRC channel where you can go and ask questions, and we have got a lot of help from them, actually. But uh, on top of that, we have no debugging symbols at le uh, also. And for me, uh, I'm not really that familiar with ARM assembly, and this was really hard. So, so we thought, uh, Let's not do debugging with GDB. Let's go pr do printouts in the kernel instead. But that didn't work either. So the first, the first time we did only blink with LEDs. <laughs> but, but eventually, we actually, uh, this is actually our first contribution to talk. 
where we actually fix these uh, printouts or panics. Af but after this, this the, the work has gone pretty good, I would say, and it's, it's been very fun, actually. Uh, but what I want to give some of my views on using Rust, because I only used Rust for one year. I would say, as probably many others, that the learning curve is rather steep. Learning ownership, interior mutability, lifetimes, and similar things, is hard to get your head around. Uh, but the c compiler in Rust is awesome. It helps you, give you good, good uh, error messages, and uh, writes, learned, educates you how to, to write good code. Uh, also, I want to claim that uh, using Rust has actually made me a better programmer, especially a better C programmer, because now I know exactly which, which operations are unsafe. For example, the reference a pointer or something like that, and that, that has helped me actually writing C as well. Um, and, and when using Rust, I have not experienced many crashes, but uh, I advise you, don't do unwrap on option types. Because then, then you're on your own. And uh, I just want to give a shout out to the Rust IRC channels because I have never experienced something like that in another community. And it's a very good resource to learn new things and ask questions that I really appreciate. Keep it up. Uh, and I also want to dream a little bit as well, what I want to see in the future. And I want to see Rust in safety critical applications, such as medical devices, autonomous vehicles, and similar fields. Uh, because I know how hard it is to write safe and secure C code, for example. You have to go through a very painful process, and it costs a lot of money, which I think uh, Rust can reduce. Uh, but one tricky thing that Rust has to do is to convince the embedded community to adopt Rust. So for example, if you try talk to an uh, embedded software engineer, he or she will say, I've been written C for 20 years and it works just fine. Um, but clearly it doesn't because we have a lot of security problems. And also when new programmers coming into the field uh, their first programming language is probably not C. They go to more high-level programming languages, which Rust is a better fit for. And the last, the last thing I want to see is uh, full-fledged IDEs with integrated debuggers in Rust, especially in the embedded community, because everybody doesn't like to use uh, raw GDB with a text prompt, even though it's very powerful. I just want to leave you with some, uh, some last words. Uh, we would like to see more contributors talk, so if you want to get, get into that, buy some board, uh, buy some of the supported boards, or port your own favorite processors. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Yeah. So, thank you, Niklas, that was amazing. We have a lot of time for questions as well. So. All right, first question over here. Hello. This might be a naive question, but is this all targeting 16-bit CPUs or also 8 bits or 32 bits? 32 bits. That was a f very short answer. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Any noticeable overhead of a Rust runtime against the corresponding code in C? Uh, good question. I think I have some slide on this. Uh, but uh, I didn't want to show this because it has more to do with uh, because we me measure the efficiency of the system calls be between the different uh, operating systems. And uh, and I think this has something to do with the overhead uh, in the architecture of the different operating systems and has not, nothing to do with, uh, with C versus Rust. So it's hard to say. So that's why I didn't want to show this picture. But I, I figured I, I get this question and it's better. Uh, yeah.
Hi. Um, at some point, you mentioned that uh, talk requires an MPU uh, to function to, to separate the processes. Um, is that a hard requirement? Because you're using a Cortex M0, and that one doesn't have an MPU. Yeah, it. yeah, you are right. Uh, no, I, we support this one, but in general, we enable the MPU. But for this one, you are right, it doesn't have an MPU. So, so the, there are two boards. We have, this is the only board that not have a real MPU, but other processors have uh, a real MPU. But TUC doesn't require the real MPU then? Uh, the assembly code for the MPU is, is there, but uh, it becomes uh, NOPS, no operations. So it's, it's, in the, it's in the kernel, but it's not used. Any further questions? Okay. Uh, what about the size of the compiled binaries? Are they significantly bigger in Rust? I have a hard problem. I don't re really know, actually. Um, I have not looked into that, but I don't think that's a problem. But uh, you have to ask uh, the real uh, talk community because they are more uh, details about that. Hey, um, how ready do you think the Rust ecosystem is for embedded development? So I don't necessarily mean things like Cargo or the compiler, but more like the crates that are out there. I think, uh, actually, if you go to, I think his name is Jorgi or something like that. Sorry if I pronounce his name uh, wrong, but I think he is better to answer that question because he has done a lot of crates in Rust for the embedded stuff. So uh, ask that question to him instead. I think it's more, more appropriate to answer that question. Shush, you are here. Do you want to answer that question? Yeah, he gives a talk later. So as answer him that question, I think it's better better person to answer that. Because I don't have performed any crates, and I don't have have any thoughts about that, really. Uh, you mentioned that uh, in C++ and embed, the uh, price of error is very high. How would you subjectively compare the price of error in embedded C and in embedded Rust? A <laughs> great question. <laughs> oh. It depends what kind of programmer you are how familiar you are with C, but uh, I, I can't really give a good, exam, uh, good answer to that question. It depends on your background. Okay, we have time for one more question, and it's just in front of the stage. Perfect. <laughs> Mic is on. Yeah. Uh, out of curiosity, how many percent of your Rust code would you say is unsafe? Good question. I, 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 would, I have not performed any, any measurements of this, but in my opinion, it's like 10% or something like that. But uh, take that with, I'm not really sure, but something in that range. All right. Thank you, and thank you for taking the time to answer all the questions.